Welcome back to our walkthrough of the Psalms. This time we're looking at Psalm 3. If you've missed the first two videos in this series, you can catch them in the playlist here on the channel. And for those that don't know, you can click on our homepage here on the Disciple Dojo YouTube channel and go down to playlists. There are a number of playlists where we've sort of collated all of the different series. We've got playlists that walk through the early chapters of Genesis. We have the entire book of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth. That's as far as we've gotten walking through verse by verse the Old Testament, but that's a big chunk that can keep people busy if you're looking for things to study for a while. We've also got playlists where we walk through the book of Revelation. We have a playlist about the Bible and science. We have playlists of Bible reviews, interviews with biblical scholars. We even have a whole playlist called Superhero Seminary, where the little action figures behind me teach concepts related to biblical theology and hermeneutics. Yeah, super nerdy. So scroll around on the page, check out some of the playlists. Sometimes in the algorithm, you only see the most recent video we've done or a video that gets more views than the others. But we have, at this point, thousands of hours of free content here at Disciple Dojo, and we want people to know about it. So you can help us let people know about it if you haven't already by subscribing and clicking that notifications icon. We just last week passed 11,000 subscribers. That's crazy. We started the year with about 5,000. So it's been amazing. And our goal for the end of the year, I don't think we're going to reach it, but still, you know, set big goals, fail big, is 20,000 subscribers. So if you haven't already subscribed, if you haven't told your friends about Disciple Dojo, and if they're into Bible nerdiness for them to subscribe as well, help us keep growing this channel. That's a very easy and completely free way to do just that. So let's take a look at Psalm 3. So I'm going to read through Psalm 3 in the old 1984 edition of the NIV, which is the study Bible that I used to teach from. And then we're going to note some things in the actual Hebrew text of the psalm, and we're going to look at how different translations have handled it, um, spanning the translation spectrum. Psalm 3, a psalm of David when he fled from his son Absalom. O Lord, how many are my foes, how many rise up against me. Many are saying of me, God will not deliver him. But you are a shield around me, O Lord. You bestow glory on me and lift up my head. To the Lord I cry aloud, and he answers me from his holy hill. I lie down and sleep. I wake again because the Lord sustains me. I will not fear the tens of thousands drawn up against me on every side. Arise, O Lord, deliver me, O God. Strike all my enemies on the jaw. Break the teeth of the wicked. From the Lord comes deliverance. May your blessing be on your people. So now let's take a closer look at Psalm 3 and see what we note about this short but pretty dense psalm. First thing to note, Psalm 3 is the first of what is going to be many, in fact, most psalms in the Bible. It's a lament. The majority of the psalms, I believe around a third of the psalms, are laments. Most of the Psalms, even though the book in Hebrew is called Tehillim, which means praises, most of the Psalms actually are laments. They're cries of desperation. Now, this to me is really important. And our friend Richard Middleton and I talked about this when he was on uh, sometime last year. The Psalms are overwhelmingly raw in how they depict God's people crying out to him. But if you contrast that with most even hymns and especially modern worship songs in contemporary Christian churches, I have trouble thinking of any modern worship songs that are basically crying out to God. Like I have trouble thinking of worship music that's not happy, that's not clappy, that's not Come on, church, let's raise our voices and shout to the Lord. God is good. Hallelujah. You know, like this, it's not that those are wrong. And there are many Psalms of that type in Israel's songbook. But think about the last time in church together, corporately, you sung a song of lament. Leave in the comments if you have, because I genuinely want to know. I can't, it's probably been over 25 years since I remember singing a song of lament in a corporate worship setting. But that's what we have in Psalm 3. And interestingly, Psalm 1, what was that? That was a celebration of the Torah and laying out the paths that people can go and, and the, the fates, you know, either be a tree planted by streams of water or be 
chaff scattered in God's judgment. And so it was laying out basically the path of Torah, of, of living according to God's word. And then Psalm 2, we saw in the last video, was this amazing aspirational triumph of the Messianic King, this depiction of God's anointed Messiah ruling to the ends of the earth and the nations taking their stand against him and being unable to stand against him. And we saw that that really almost never was the case in Israel's history. And so that that psalm was seen, certainly by the time of Jesus, as pointing forward to the coming Messiah, the coming anointed one who would do those things. But Israel's songbook opens with these two sort of triumphant songs, and then song three now takes a sharp turn. It begins with the title. Now, in Hebrew, the title of the psalm is verse 1. And even in the Septuagint, the title of the psalm is Psalm 1. By the way, this word, so you can see in the Septuagint here, psalmos. Psalmos is the word that means psalm. And so this is where the title in our English Bibles, which are based largely on the Septuagint, come from. A psalm to daoed a psalm of David. In Hebrew, the word is mizmor, and mizmor just means song. It comes from Zion Memresh, the root verb that means to sing praise. And so a mizmor is the equivalent of psalmos in Greek, and it's where the title psalms comes from in our English Bible. And so this is a mizmor le David, and this can either mean it's a psalm to David a psalm for David, a psalm about David, or a psalm by David, Babacho. Mifne Absalom Bano. So in his fleeing or when he fled from the face of or from the presence of Absalom, his son. So this is a psalm either by David recounting the experiences when he was on the run. This is 2 Samuel chapters 15, 16, 17. And you can read that account. David had to literally flee Jerusalem. And along the way, his enemies, including some from Saul's family, hurled insults at him. Um, figuratively and literally would throw rocks at him, pelting him with rocks as he was leaving, as he was fleeing in shame from his own son, looking as if he had lost control of God's holy hill of Zion, the city where he ruled from. So if that's what's happening when this psalm was written, then this is David writing, singing about his experience at the time. Or other scholars have said, no, this is a psalm about like dedicated to or written as if like something of a, a retelling of an historical event through the lens of a song of lament. So whichever you think is more plausible, that's fine. It doesn't really change the content of the psalm. But the whole point is this first verse in Hebrew and in Greek in English translations and particularly Christian English translations, the verse is not actually a verse. It's put as a title. And some translations, like the message, for instance, here, they leave it out completely. Others, I think maybe the NEB or the REB, I can't remember, some other Bible translations just leave out the titles. They say the titles were all added later. And that's unfortunate because you can see here in the Septuagint and here in the Hebrew, the titles are right there and they're the first verse. So if you wonder why, let's say you're picking up a JPS or a modern JPS Tanakh, and the verses are different than what you read in a King James or a New Revised or ESV, that's why. All of these Christian Bibles don't include the title as a verse. They start the verse in what the Hebrew has as verse 2. In English Christian translations, that's verse 1. I don't really know why they do that. I haven't done a deep dive into how the numbering was worked out in the different translations or when this split occurred. But when it comes to the Psalms... The numbering of the Psalms and even how the Psalms are divided was not uniform in the Hebrew manuscripts. But now in verse 2, we get into what is sort of the body of the Psalm. And it starts out with God's name, Adonai, Yahweh, his actual name. And in English, so I'll read the, I read the NIV or I'll read the Lexham English Bible. It says, Yahweh, how many are my enemies? Many are rising against me. That's not very poetic. I mean, in English, that just doesn't sound very poetic. And King James doesn't do much better. Lord, how are they increased that trouble me? Many are they that rise up against me. And Eugene Peterson in the message tries to be vivid. So he says, God, look, enemies past counting, 
enemies sprouting like mushrooms. So these are all ways to translate this, but I want you to hear it in Hebrew so can, you can at least understand how in, in this case, there's actually something close to rhyme going on, even though most Hebrew poetry isn't rhyme, it's based on parallelism. But I just want you to hear the way it sounds. And so I'm going to pull up a cordance where I have my audio Hebrew and I haven't figured out how to get this feed directly into the recording software that I'm using here. So I'm just going to tilt the mic over. So I want you to listen just to what we call verse one in our English Bibles, but it's actually verse two in the Hebrew. Listen to how it sounds. Adonai, marabu tsarai, rabim kamim alai. Marabu tsarai, rabim kamim alai. Do you hear how that flows? How that is much more singable than how many are my enemies, many are rising against me. But that's literally what it means. He's crying out, Yahweh or Adonai, how many tsarai, my enemies, rabim kamim, many rising up a lie against me or upon me or over me. So it flows beautifully in Hebrew, English, not so much. And then this many, rabim, it's going to continue in the next line, rabim omarim. So many are saying lanafshi to my soul. Many are telling me, saying to my soul is literally what it says. Ein Yeshuata, lo belohim tsela. So ein, many are saying to me, ein, there is not, this is a negation particle, ein, there is not Yeshuata. Does that sound familiar? Yeshua? This is the word for where Jesus' name comes from. Yeshua, salvation or deliverance. That's what it means from the verb yasha, to deliver, to save. So there is not salvation to him. Belohim. This is ba prefix to Elohim. There is not salvation to him in God. So these many that are rising up against him, many are his enemies. And these enemies rising up are saying there's no salvation for him in God. And so we come to the first occurrence of selah in Hebrew. And selah, we don't know what it means. Different interpreters have suggested different meanings. It would depend on what word it comes from, what clues we might get from cognates in other languages. Some have said based on, I think, maybe either Phoenician or Akkadian or something like that, they've suggested that this means to pause. And so it's like a musical pause. Others have suggested that it means something else, like maybe lift up your voice or something. I, I don't know. And from what I read, most interpreters don't know either. And so some translations just leave it out or like the RSV put it in parentheses. The Septuagint here in the Greek, you can see they left it out. There's no Selah. So keep these terms in mind, deliverance and rise up and many, because it's going to come into play throughout this Psalm. So verse three, and I'm just referring to this through the English verse numbers, because most of you watching this are probably reading the Psalms in an English Christian translation. I'm not saying the English Christian verses are right. I'm saying all verses were added much later after the text. Originally, there were no verses. But for the sake of ease of viewers, I'm just going to refer to the verses as listed in English Christian Bibles because I'm an English speaking Christian. So verse three now, but you Yahweh, v'ata Adonai. So this is comparing this is literally and you or but you the can mean either of those it's just a simple conjunction but you Adonai so it's an emphatic so the many are saying all of this the many are saying God's not going to deliver him but you Yahweh Adonai Magen Baadi Magen this is the word for shield you are a shield Ba'adi, around me. Kavodi, muremim roshi. You are a shield around me. And that's interesting because shields don't encircle people. A shield was a shield you'd hold in front of you. And so this is stretching the image. It's picturing God as almost like this, like, portable fortress. God is shielding him from who, who, why would he need to be a shield all around him? Because Rabim, many are rising up around him. So he's shielded on all sides in the image of this song. My glory. Now the NIV here says, you bestow glory on me. But you can see here in Hebrew, it's one word and it's just my glory. So you, Yahweh, my shield around me, my glory. God is his glory. And the Septuagint does the same thing. It just says, doxamu, my glory. And you can see that in a lot of the translations. The LEB just says, my glory. King James, my glory. 
JPS, my glory, my glory. Now the message, Eugene Peterson does something interesting. He says, you ground my feet. And I'm guessing, I don't know for sure, but I'm guessing what he's playing on is this word, kavod. Kavod is the word for glory, but it's also the word for like honor. Literally though, it means weight or heaviness. And so he, I think Peterson might be trying to pick up on that concept of kavod, meaning heaviness, weightedness. You are what weighs me, what grounds me. I think, I'm not 100% sure, but most of the other translations just take it as my glory. And so the psalmist, he's being insulted by his enemies, but he knows that his glory is God. God's his glory. And so God is the one, Merim Roshi, lifting my head, lifting my head. This is an image of someone whose head, you know, we have in English a similar concept, hang your head in shame. So someone whose head is hung in shame, to lift their head means to give them glory, to instill honor in them publicly to lift their head. You see this imagery elsewhere of somebody lifting someone's head. There's a play on words in the dream that Joseph interprets in Genesis when he says, yeah, uh, Pharaoh's going to lift your head from off of you. And it's a word play when he's interpreting the baker's dream. Go back and check that out in the later chapters of Genesis. And so the Tanakh, the modern JPS translation, they say, he who holds my head high. That's a pretty good way to bring out the meaning of it. And so he continues, with my voice, I call to Yahweh and he answers me from his holy hill. Mehar Kadasho. Now we saw this in the very last Psalm when God established his king on Zion, my holy hill. And how this word har, it, it can mean hill. It can even mean hill country. It, it, it's not a specific word, but most of the time its basic meaning is mountain. And you can see the JPS translates it, his holy mountain. So this is not the first time, nor is it the last time we will see Zion, the temple linked with or equated to God's holy mountain the mountain of God. We've talked about this here a couple of summers ago. We did a series on the symbolism of Sinai and the tabernacle. And there's a specific video, I'll link it in the description below, where we look at the imagery of the mountain of God and how the tabernacle was intended to be a replica of the mountain of God. Well, the tabernacle then was replaced by the temple. And so the temple had that same imagery and that same connotation. So the temple is the mountain of God. Now, if you've been to Israel, Zion isn't a mountain. I mean, Jerusalem's not a mountain. It's not even the highest of the surrounding areas. And that's something of the irony of the term Mount Zion is that Zion is theologically God's mountain, even though geographically there are many other mountains around the land that are much taller. But the geography isn't what the authors of scripture have in mind when they describe Zion as God's mountain. The theology is what they have in mind. But it's referring to the temple. It's referring to the place where God dwells, his holy mountain. That is the temple. And so when the psalmist calls, Kali el Adonai ekra, my voice I call out to Adonai, to the Lord. He answers me from his holy mountain, Selah. And so because the psalmist knows that God answers his prayers, we move into the next verse. He says, I lay down and slept. I woke up because Yahweh sustains me. And it's emphatic in Hebrew. Verse six, this is hard to bring out in English, but it's because of what's just happened, because of God answering him and his confidence in who God is. Ani shakavti. I myself. See, shakavti means I lay down. But when you put a knee on it, it's like saying I, me, I lay down. It's, it's a contrast. It's emphatic. So in the presence of these enemies, because Yahweh is the one who answers from his holy hill and that he is my shield, he is the one defending me from enemies. I lay down and I sleep and I get up because key for Adonai, Yahweh, Yismacheni, the Lord supports or sustains me, helps me. And so because it's God helping, sustaining, allowing the psalmist to rest, even in the midst of being surrounded by his enemies, verse 7, lo ira, me rivavoth am, I will not fear, me rivavoth. This is a play on Rabim, this resh bait bait, 
Ravav is the same word that Ravin comes from. It comes from Rav, which means many. And this word Rivavoth means multitudes or myriads or tens of thousands, just this vast number, the many. And so he said, I will not fear the many um, people, Asher Saviv Shatu Alai, who around stand against me. Kind of a wooden literal way to put it. So some of the translations smooth it out. I am not afraid of the ten thousands of people who all around have set themselves against me. Or the Tanakh. I have no fear of the myriad forces arrayed against me on every side. And this is a both perfectly fine ways of saying this. Eugene Peterson, fearless before the enemy mobs coming at me from all sides. And so in the next verse, the psalmist cries out, Kuma Adonai, like Arise, Yahweh, arise, Lord. Hosheni, deliver me. This is a form of that same verb that we saw at the beginning when the enemies, like, check this out. Look back at the beginning of the psalm. Ma ravu, many enemies, ravim, kumim, many enemies. So the many is there at the beginning and rising against me, rising, kamim, rising. There's the verb from kum to rise. And the many who are arising against the psalmist, what did they say? Yeshua ta lo, salvation not to him from God. In other words, God will not save him. Now we go down to the end of the psalm and the psalmist, inclusio style, bookends it, kuma adonai, Rise up, the many are rising against me, but I am imploring the one, Yahweh, to rise up in my defense. Hosheni, deliver me, save me, do what the many who are surrounding me on all sides said you're not going to do, save me. And then the deliverance that the psalmist is asking for is very vivid. He sort of wishes, it's literally, that you would strike all my enemies so this is sort of a wish, like, oh, that you would strike all my enemies. Or it's not a command, but it's a it's it's pleading, it's it's asking God to do this. It's imprecatory. Strike, hit from the word naka, which means to strike or to smite. Sometimes it means to kill, sometimes it just means to hit, sometimes it means to smack. Naka, strike all my enemies. Kol oyavai. And then this phrase, lechi sheni, lechi sheni, jaw tooth or jaw and tooth. So strike all my, oh, that you would strike all my enemies, jaw and tooth. Rushaim shavarta, wicked ones you would shatter or smash. So different translations handle this differently. L-E-B, rise up, O Yahweh, deliver me, O my God, for you strike all my enemies on the cheek, the teeth of the wicked you break. So this is sort of making it like a declarative, like this is what you do, God. This is the type of God you are. The Tanakh, rise, O Lord, deliver me, O my God, for you slap all my enemies in the face. You break the teeth of the wicked. Peterson tries to bring it out poetically. Up, God, my God, help me. Slap their faces, first this cheek, then the other. Your fist hard in their teeth. And this kind of mimics the lack of grammar that's in the actual Hebrew. This is not grammatically. This is literally, my God, that you struck all my enemy cheek teeth, wicked ones you shattered. So it's not good prose, but it is very vivid poetry. Now, some interpreters have said this is not like we think of this. Okay, strike the cheek. Uh, knock their teeth out. Like we're thinking of a fist fight, God getting in a fist fight. And that may very well be the image that this is pulling from. But in Psalm 58, 6, there's going to be a parallel to this. And we'll go there and we'll see the psalmist in Psalm 58 is going to say, Oh God, break their teeth in their mouth. Break off the fangs of the young lions, O Yahweh. Or as the Tanakh says, shatter the fangs of the lions, O Lord. So breaking the teeth is put in parallel with shattering the fangs. And the image is not of a person who's getting their teeth knocked out, but of it's of a, a, a lion, a predator with fangs. And it's basically asking God to defang the beast, to remove the threat. So it could be that sort of image where the wicked are being portrayed as lions uh, attacking and surrounding and threatening the psalmist. And so he's praying for God to defang the threat. Or he could be praying, no, God, knock their teeth out. Either way, the psalmist is praying an imprecatory prayer. that He's appealing to God 
God, you are the God that does this. He's not taking vengeance into his own hand, but he's calling out for God to take vengeance on his enemies. This is a theme that we're going to see throughout the Psalms, particularly in the imprecatory Psalms. And we'll have to wrestle with what that means for our theology and our ethics. But remember, the Psalms are songs. The Psalms are not an ethics handbook. The Psalms are the sincere, raw, unfiltered cries of God's people to God. And in this case, in the face of enemies surrounding him. And so the psalm ends, Ladonai Hashua. Does that sound familiar? You should be picking up this word by now, even if you don't speak Hebrew. Hashua. This is the salvation, the deliverance. This is the word that Yahshua, Jesus, comes from. To Yahweh, to Adonai, to the Lord is deliverance or salvation. Alemcha birchathecha selah. Upon your people, your blessing, selah. And so it's either saying, like the LAB says, may your blessing be over your people. And that's how the New Tanakh renders it. Or the King James is just, thy blessing is upon thy people, like a statement of fact. Either way, it's the same thing. So what we have in Psalm 3 is the first lament, the first imprecation. There are going to be many more of these throughout the Psalms, but it comes right on the heels of a psalm celebrating the unbeatableness of Israel's king. Right after that, you have a song where Israel's Davidic king is crying out to God because his enemies are all around him and he is powerless in the face of them. That is part of the paradox of the psalms. You're going to have these triumphant mountaintop psalms and then immediately you're going to be down in the valley. And that's life. I mean, we live that out all the time. But I want to end by reading a couple of excerpts from Psalms commentaries that I thought were just beautifully written. This one's by Rolf Jacobson in the New International Commentary on the Old Testament Psalms volume. He says, The psalmist cannot match the power of the enemies, for he is powerless. The psalmist cannot match the number of the enemies, for he's alone. But the psalmist can match the unbelief of the enemies, for he has faith in his God. The psalmist asks God to rise up in response to those rising up against the sufferer, to deliver in response to those who claim God will not deliver. So it's such a cool use of wordplay. And, you know, we miss it in English translation sometimes, but it it begins with saying, my enemies, the many are doing this, but you, the one, the one that really matters, you do this. And so it's a crying out for basically God to do what God does, to be faithful to his promises. It creates a tension between what the previous psalm had celebrated and what this psalm is experiencing. And in his Bible Speaks Today book on the Psalms, Michael Wilcock puts it this way. He says, it is as if the compilers of the Psalter set out first in Psalms 1 and 2, the underlying reality, the royal privileges of God's sons, at that time, the Davidic king and his people, in our day, Jesus and his people. Then from Psalm 3 onwards, the earthly realities, which even such privileged people have to face. David installed on the holy hill by a God who defies the rage of nations, now chased off by an impudent upstart like Absalom. In theory, unthinkable. In practice, a common experience. But however far from the holy hill we seem to be, the lines of communication, I cry and he answers, are unbreakable. Psalm 2 has already told us what God's answer is. So this is the beauty of the Psalms. You're going to get the aspirational and what we know to be true in the heavenly realm. And then you're going to get what looks like the facts on the ground. You're going to get the messiness of life, the highs and the lows, the many surrounding us on all sides. But because of the one, we're able to lie down and sleep and get up again. So that's all for Psalm 3. If you found this helpful, would love for you to subscribe to the channel, click the notifications icon, let other people know about this series. Stay tuned in the next video. We're going to jump right into Psalm 4. And it's another lament. Get used to those. You're going to see them a lot. Israel has always been a people who sing their praises and they sing their sorrows. And no better example of that than the Psalms. So hopefully that will shape us today in church who think for some reason that all praise has to be happy. Uh, The Psalms stand as an eternal testimony against that Christian urban legend. 
That's all for now. We'll see you next time back here at Disciple Dojo. As always, keep training.